I want to speak to you on the subject today of when a man after God's own heart has heart trouble. When a man after God's own heart has heart trouble. You may be seated. I'm going to ask you to turn with me, please, to uh, 2 Samuel 24. 2 Samuel 24. And I, I want to read one of the most confusing incidents in all of the Word of God. I, all I can tell you is that I have read this passage over and over again through the years and most recently last night and this morning. And I still do not have a complete understanding of, of these passages. Um, I just can't figure out why David did what he did at this time and season of his life. But hopefully, with the help of the Holy Spirit, we're going to unravel some of it, and hopefully that unraveling will help us as well this morning. Because how many of you have ever done something and looked back and thought, I don't know why in the world I did that. Come on. We've all been guilty of that. Uh, I'll never forget hearing the story from an old man of God who just loved to tell me funny stories. Uh, every night when we would go after the crusade meetings, we would go to his home and his wife would fix some little sandwiches and we would sit down and he would begin to tell me stories, much to my delight. And I'll never forget one of the stories he told me was when he was in Bible school at Zion Bible Institute in New England. And there was a man that came through that had been given a phenomenal gift by God, supernatural, to play the piano. And he didn't practice. He didn't take lessons. He just got the anointing to play, just sat down as an adult and started playing the piano beautifully. And he could retain that and play anytime he wanted. So he came to this Bible college with this wonderful anointing. He was also a preacher. And so he began to talk that night about God who was able to do anything and everything that we believe for. And my friend said that he was sitting there beside his buddy and they were worshiping and it was kind of at the end of the service, but the place was still filled because people were so moved by this wonderful example of a supernatural gift of music being imparted just like that. And he said he looked to his right and his buddy had left wasn't there and he looked for him and then he spied him on the platform and he was moving toward the piano and everybody in the audience now had stopped their personal prayer and they were also watching him to see what he was going to do well he sat down at the piano and he began to worship and just to thank God and then he forcefully put his hands on that piano. And it sounded like, boom, blum, blum. Well, then he said, oh, maybe I've got to do this, you know, a little more vigorously. And so he went, boom, blum, 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 blum. Well, by now, any trace of the anointing that had been in the room was gone. <laughs> uh, and he got up and slinked back into his chair beside my buddy and he said boy I'm not going to ever do that again <laughs> how many of you have ever had a moment like that where you said boy I'm not ever going to do that again well this is one of those moments but let me just tell you the fallout of this moment <laughs> is much more costly than anything like that um, verse one in Second Samuel 24. I'm going to just read through this story and uh, at least part of it to get us going. Again, the anger of the Lord burned against Israel 
and he incited David against them. Now, there's another account of this story that says that Satan came against David. And he said, go and take a census of Israel and Judah. So the king said to Joab, the army commanders with him, go throughout all the tribes of Israel from Dan to Beersheba and enroll the fighting men so that I may know how many there are. Now, this is what you've got to understand. It was well known in Israel that God did not want a census unless he asked for it. It was well known that this was going to anger God. And Joab, the commander, knew it. And he replied to the king, May the Lord your God multiply the troops a hundred times over, and may the eyes of my Lord the king see it. But why does my Lord the king want to do such a thing? I'll stop right there. Why in the world did David do this? The scripture does not directly answer this question. But here are a couple of plausible explanations. First, it is clear that unlike the census of Moses in Numbers 1 and 2, this did not come as the command of God. There was a time in history when God asked Moses to number the people. Second Samuel records the anger of the Lord kindled against Israel. For whatever reason, that is the first reason. And this has to be harmonized with 1 Chronicles 21 and 1, which describes the same story. Here's what the Bible says there. Satan stood up against Israel and moved David to number Israel. Now, how can both of these statements be true? 2 Samuel 24, 1 must be understood in terms of what God, listen, allowed Satan to do. Not direct action on the part of God. And it brings us to a question, doesn't it? How active can Satan be in the life of a believer? Here's the Bible-based question, as active as God allows. As active as God allows. Remember the story of Job? How many of you remember the story of Job? Satan comes to God, says, Job only serves you because of all of the blessings that you've given him. You take his blessings away, he'll curse you, I promise. And God gave Satan permission to take Job's family and possessions. And when you turn to Job 2 and 3, this is what, uh, after Satan is allowed to bring this trial upon Job, this is what you hear. God says to Satan, he holds fast to his integrity, although you incited me against him to destroy him without cause. Now, the same word, is used in 2 Samuel concerning David's sin that is used in Job 2 and 3 concerning Job's integrity. Although one concerns God and David and the other Satan and God, it's interesting because of what is demonstrated in God's own words. Listen to this. Satan incited God to destroy Job, but... God was not the one who touched Job. It was Satan. He allowed Satan to act. It was not God, but Satan who brought the attack. In the same way, God allowed Satan to move David, to tempt David in an unusual way. But just as the story of Job, 2 Samuel 24, 1 speaks of God's allowance as God's action. It's actually 
his allowance, what he allowed. What we must see here is whether Satan or God, there is still a factor, the X factor of the will and the choice of a man. If God is moving on you, you still have a choice. If Satan has come against you, you still have a choice. Job was immovable, even in tragedy. But just, just the temptation to disobey God's mandate and number Israel became irresistible to David. What in the world? Come on, hero. Come on, champion. Come on, king. You're my man. I'm betting on you. I believe in you. You're the greatest hero in all of human history. And what? Just the suggestion. And you fold your tents. What did God see in David that he felt he had to deal with? Why was this temptation so immediately appealing to David? You know, last week we talked about the nature and process of temptation from James 1 and 14. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. In other words, when we move towards sin, it is initiated in our heart. We... We attach ourselves to those things that are appealing to the deepest part of us. What was it in David's heart that God knew he had to expose? It could have only been the one thing that always brings destruction. Proverbs 16 and 18 says, Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before fall. Let me tell you, ladies and gentlemen, it is possible even for a man after God's own heart to have heart trouble. Because this entire episode is based on the fact that the man after God's own heart had a desperate heart condition. And what about us? Do we really know our hearts? Do we really know our hearts? You see, this numbers thing was always a big deal to God. God always wanted his people to understand that he was the defender, he was the victor, that the reason they won was not because of the numbers of soldiers that were able to be trained and raised up and recruited for the army. It was not because of their armaments. It was not because of the thick walls of their city. It was not because of their strategic and military excellence. It was because of only one thing, and that was he was with them. And so why was God offended when anyone numbered the people it was because he understood that it was the evil and pride in a leader's heart that wanted him to be able to proudly say how many regiments he had and how many were in the Calvary and, and how many were on the battle line and, and how many defenses that they had been able to develop. And he saw that in our men. He saw that he had heart trouble. Here's what we have to know. In Deuteronomy 7 and 7, God declared, the Lord did not set his love on you or choose you because you were more in number than anybody than any other people, for you were the least of all peoples. And then when he sent Gideon 
to lead the Israelites against the Midianites. This is what he said. It's so strange to even read this, but we understand the story of how God gave this resounding victory for Gideon and the Israelites with just 300 soldiers. And his first dealing with Gideon was this, when Gideon gathered every person he could that could bear arms to go against the enemy, then God's first response was, the people you are, who are with you are too many for me to give the Midianites into their hands. You know, this may be what God's saying already to some of you. You know, right now you're asking why God doesn't break through for you. You might be too smart for God to use you. You might have too much going on for God to use you. You may be too talented in your own eyes for God to use you. You, you might have too much ability for God to use you. The, the breakthrough you're waiting for from God may never come as long as there is pride in your heart that you can get it done. And so... Every example throughout the scripture has to do with God saying to all of us, you can't do it without me. I am your source. You know, David as a young man understood that. He got that. 1 Samuel 17, 4 says, the Lord does not save with sword and spear. These are his words. For the battle is the Lord's. And he says this to Goliath. He will give you into our hands. What you're seeing doesn't impress you. I know I'm not dressed like you. I know I am only half as tall as you. I know I've not fought one legitimate battle. I know that all I've got is a sling and you have a sword and you have a shield that I can't even lift. But all I can tell you is that's not the issue here. I'm running against you, and the fact is, the Lord will give you into our hands. Maybe that David, in his old age, he's either forgotten it or he's lost the same faith in God he had as a young man. More than likely, he's full of pride, and he's stepping back after this tremendously successful reign, when all of the economic problems of his realm have been solved, when he is the shining star of the Mideast, when he is legendary and songs are being sung about him and there's honor in every corner of the realm, and he's looking at Israel and saying, I built this thing. I built this thing. And he wants some numbers to prove it. He had somehow lost his compass as God's leader. If only he could have gone through his archives and found the lyrics of a song he wrote years before called the Royal Psalm, which would have been the national anthem of Israel during David's time. If only he could have pulled up those lyrics from the chief choir director at the temple. And he could have sat in the quiet of the evening before he made such a dreadful mistake. And he could have read, May the Lord answer you when you're in distress. May the name of the God of Jacob protect you. May he send you help from the sanctuary and grant you support from Zion. May he remember all your sacrifices and accept your burnt offerings. May he give you the desire of your heart and make all your plans succeed. And may we shout for joy over your victory and lift up our banners in the name of our God. May the Lord grant all your requests. Now this I know. The Lord gives victory to his anointed. He answers him from his heavenly sanctuary with the victorious power of his right hand. Some trust in chariots. Some trust in horses. But we trust in the name of the Lord our God. Yeah. 
We could discuss the rich truths and powerful warnings of this episode of David's life for hours, but I want to focus on four lessons. Here's the first. God is extremely committed to the quality of your spiritual heart health. That's what this story tells me. God is extremely committed to the quality of your spiritual heart health. Today, God knows exactly what's in your heart. Every corner of it. He knows where you stand today in relationship to his will and the purpose that he revealed to you. And he warns us about our heart health spiritually. In Jeremiah 17, 9 and 10, the word of God says, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? I, the Lord, search the heart and test the mind to give every man, listen to this, according to his ways. God rewards you not according to your hands or where your feet go or what your mouth says, but he rewards you according to the ways of your heart, according to the fruit of his deeds. Proverbs 4.23, keep your heart with all vigilance, for from it flow the springs of life. Luke 6.45, these are the words of Jesus, by the way. So you need to perk up and really hear these. The good person out of the good treasure of his heart produces good. And the evil person out of his evil treasure produces evil. For out of the abundance of the heart, his mouth speaks. But you know the most powerful verse on God knowing our hearts is found surprisingly at the anointing of, shep of a shepherd boy named David. All the big strapping warrior sons of, of Jesse had been eliminated from being prospects for the next king. And now God speaks to Samuel, who's just a little bit disappointed that none of the big, strong, royal-looking dudes were chosen. And this is what he says about David who doesn't look the part, y'all. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not look on his appearance or the height of his stature. Talking about one of David's brothers, because I've rejected him. For the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. And those big, strong siblings of David marched right through the room and out the back door. None of them chosen. And then David comes in. Meek, mild, dressed as a shepherd, just a youth. <laughs> you have to understand, the last dude that Samuel anointed king was a whole head and shoulders taller than everybody. He looked the part. I mean, this guy was the guy you'd think was in WWE. He was a impressive looking dude. And then here comes the shepherd. God says, I'm choosing him because of what I see and because of what you can't see, Samuel. I'm choosing him because of what's going on in his heart. You see, what you need to know is that God knows what's going on in your heart. May I just tell you this? You need to allow God to show you what he sees in your heart. You need to start listening to what comes out of your mouth because the fact is, a lot of the things that are coming out of your mouth are telling you that there is pride in your heart. Now, folks, this principle doesn't just work in our 
in our businesses and in our livelihood and in the blessings that we call material blessings because that's kind of where our, our heart races to sometimes. And maybe even that tells us something about what's in our hearts. But this heart thing actually controls every phase and factor of your life. There is not one thing in your life that is not affected by your heart. And I'm going to tell you, a prideful heart will see to it that you have an inferior marriage, that you have an inferior work life, that you have an inferior prosperity, that you have inferior goals, that you have an inferior ability to meet those goals. A prideful heart will see to it that your relationships are impacted and affected, that your greatness is limited because God's certainly not going to take you there and magnify something that is already a problem at this point in your life. God sees what is in your heart. Now, here's the second thing. God will do whatever is necessary to deal with our prideful hearts. Do you know that there's not anything God will not stop at to deal with you to make sure that you don't have the end result of a prideful heart, which is separation from him for eternity. so easy to get pride in our lives. So easy to become proud of ourselves. I'll never forget when Carolina Lee was very small. She was on a trip with, uh, no, it wasn't uh, Carolina Lee. I'm sorry, it was Destiny. Man, I'm really messing my old <laughs> decades up here. And, uh, it was just, in fact, she was our only little girl, and she uh, looked, we were, Deons and I were sitting on the front seat, and she looked into the mirror in front of us, and she smiled, and she said, I am so beautiful. <laughs> and uh, I think it was Deonza that said this to her, because I don't think I'd have said anything like this to her, but I think Deonza said, uh, it was probably me, really. I said, well, baby, we've, we've got... We, we have to stay humble in our hearts now. We can't be proud. She says, oh, Daddy, I'm not being proud. I'm just being grateful. <laughs> you know, some of us, we're just being grateful, baby. <laughs> but the fact is, we have got to deal with the pride in our hearts. And let me just tell you something. I'm not here to condemn you. I'm here to help you. You came to the heart surgeon today, and his name is Jesus, and he's going to fix your heart before you leave this place today. The Bible says God was not pleased that Israel was numbered, so he punished Israel. David said to God, I've sinned very much by doing this thing, but now I beg you, take away the sin of your servant, for I have done a very foolish thing. You know, yesterday I had the great honor of preaching my head coach at Captain Shreve's funeral, Lee Hedges. Lee Hedges was a legend in his own time. He had a stadium named after him. He, he was the coach of many of the leaders of the city. And if he didn't coach him in football, he coached him in, in tennis. He had two national championships in tennis. People don't even know that. He had 18 state championships in tennis. Lee Hedges was extraordinary. He was a great math teacher. He taught our mayor, who is the mayor right now, math at Captain Shreve. He was a legend in his own time. Now, there are a whole lot of people that are legends in their own mind. But Lee Hedges was a legend in his own time. And everybody in this town knew it except Lee Hedges. He was the only one that didn't know it. The Bible makes it very clear that humility is the only sure path to greatness. And it also makes it very, very clear that pride is the only sure path to destruction. It was pride that got King Saul. 
and opened the throne for David. You remember what Samuel said to Saul at the end of his reign when it was all over, when he didn't have another chance to redeem himself? This is what Samuel said to Saul. Is it not true that even though you were insignificant, small in your own eyes, you were made the head of the tribes of Israel and the Lord anointed you king over Israel. He was saying to Saul, do you know what God looked for in you? It wasn't that you were six foot five or whatever. It wasn't that you were so impressive in your ability as a soldier. What God saw was your heart and he saw humility. He saw that you were small in your own eyes. But he went on to say, but now you have been lifted up in pride and God has rejected you. Do you remember the humble days, folks? Come on, go with me on this. The days when the issues of your heart were complete dependency, never feeling adequate, always needing more of God, trusting him, leaning on him, needing him, waiting on him all night long in prayer. But maybe like David, you're ready to number the people. How much did I make again on that amazing last investment of mine? How did I turn that bad deal into a great deal? Did you hear me give that guy a piece of my mind? On and on and on. The sure symptoms of a prideful heart pour out of us. And God loves you too much. God loves you too much. He's too committed to your future. He is too faithful to let that go. He is going to deal with it. And if the first thing he does doesn't do it, he's going to do something else. And he's going to do something else. And the judgments upon your life will escalate and escalate and escalate. Not because he hates you or is hard on you or wants to destroy you. But because he understands that the thing that is in your heart is far more destructive than anything you could ever experience going through the process of his judgments. This is pre You're not going to hear this preaching much. But I'm going to tell you, every man of God in the nation needs to preach on this. Because right now, our entire nation is teeter-tottering on the edge of an abyss of total destruction because of the sin of pride. Joe McNeely was one of my very favorite people. He was my brother. I want to tell you, Sports Illustrated did a story, and they talked about the quarterback that was always walking around quoting Philippians. That would be me, I guess. And the linebacker that was the leader of the devil's bunch, and this writer had a great time talking about how opposite and polarized our team was as far as the leadership. What they failed to talk about was how incredibly close that Joe and I were all that time. Even when he was not serving God, had no plans to serve God, whenever he had a close call, he was always grabbing me and pulling me aside to talk to me. And you know, you couldn't resist him because I mean, the guy was just an animal. He was so strong. And so he would just grab me at the locker and just kind of grab me up and come on, I got to talk to you. I got to talk to you. And I was just kind of on my tiptoes going with him, you know, and he always, I don't know. He thought, he thought the place we needed to talk was the stall in the bathroom. <laughs> I was a little uncomfortable with that, but he would go into a stall thinking we had privacy. Now, nobody hears here. So I'd be standing there in the stall with him and he's whispering. So anybody that walks in can see there are four feet under there. <sighs> and he would say, you got to pray for me. I was in a bar at the electric circus on Saturday night. And a guy put a gun in my mouth and pulled the trigger. And I shouldn't be here. You got to pray for me, Duran. You got to pray. Tears streaming on cheeks. I'd say, okay, Joe, I'll pray for you right now. No, no, that's okay. Just pray for me later. And he's out. <laughs> but I'll never forget the day when his wife walked out on him. I'm going to ask the musicians to come, please. Never forget the day when his wife walked out on him. 
And uh, she had endured. Just, I tell you, just the, just the keyboards. I'm sorry, ladies. Just the keyboards. Just the keyboards. And she, she walked out on him, and he realized she was really the only thing he loved or needed or wanted in life. Didn't realize it until that happened. And so he called me, and he said, Hey, Durant. I said, yes. Joe, how you doing, man? I got reborn again. That's the way he put it. I said, really? You, really? He said, yes, I got reborn again. I said, praise God, Joe. Tell me about it. Brenda walked out on me. She left me. I said, you know, I was so abusive. He said, I got so depressed. I said, I went to my office and I took my pistol and uh, I called the paramedics and told them that I'd accidentally shot myself cleaning my gun because I I had an insurance clause where my family couldn't get the money if it was suicide. And then I put the gun to my stomach because I wanted to try to stay conscious long enough to be able to tell them that it was an accident. And I pulled the trigger. He said they came and they started working on me and I heard them say we're losing him we're losing him he said it got so dark Duran it got so dark he said but I remembered those talks that we had in the locker room. You told me, Joe, if you ever find yourself in a position where you know that you're facing death, if you will call out on the name of the Lord, he will save you. And he said, I, I called on the name of the Lord. I said, suddenly, it got light again, and I stabilized. He had been out of the hospital 11 days and still had tubes in him. When he walked into Rodney Duran Chapel, where I was doing something in the middle of the day, and I turned around and saw him, he came over and hugged me, and I hugged him. My dad came over and laid hands on him, and he was baptized on the Holy Ghost. And his life was completely transformed for a while. But what you have to understand is that Joe McNeely had lived his life of pride much longer than he had lived for Jesus. And very frankly, he didn't have a lot of support where he was. He began to slip back into some old ways. He began to pick up some of the old habits. No, he didn't go back as deep as he was. And he never, ever was not proud of Jesus. He was always, every time he was asked, a bold witness that Jesus was his Lord and Savior. But here's what you have to understand, ladies and gentlemen, is that God doesn't, doesn't spend his time dealing with the pride of unbelievers. They aren't his. God deals with his church. God deals with us. Joe was out on his ranch one day. You know, we're still in touch all the time. He was, he was the best uncle to my kids. He loved them. Denny Rodney lived a whole summer with him one year. He's on his horse. And 
he was going to give his horse some water and he picked up a hose and he put the hose into the little trough that was elevated on the it was a plastic thing that was elevated on this fence. And when he put the hose down, the, the hose, because of the pressure, went like, and it looked like a snake, and the horse bolted. He fell off the horse, and the horse kicked him and broke his neck, and he was a quadriplegic. We visited him a lot. And I'll never forget one of the last times I was with him. I said, Joe, I am so sorry that you are hurting like this. I'm so sorry that you're in this condition. And he looked at me and said these words. He said, Denny, it's all right. It's a good thing. I said, what, how could it be a good thing? He said, number one, he said, I hurt some people really bad in my life. Really bad. And he said, I don't resent this. He said, and the other thing is this, Danny. Not everything, listen to this. Not everything was right in my heart. And now, maybe God knew this was the only way that I could get everything right in my heart. Let me tell you what being a believer is. Being a believer is not about a one-time trip to the altar where you ask Jesus Christ to be your Savior and then you go out and live like hell and do whatever you want to do the rest of your life. You know what being a believer is? It is when you come to an altar, give your heart to Jesus, and you take that issue more seriously than any issue in the world. That you have a new heart and you are going to be accountable for a new heart. I have two more points. I'm not going to preach them. Not even because of time. It's just that I want to stop right here. I want to embrace the anointing that's in this room. God has descended into this room over the last few minutes. I feel him powerfully. My friend, I am not speaking to average believers here. I'm speaking to all believers. I'm speaking to people that are in the ministry. and I'm speaking to people that are in leadership and I'm speaking to people that never miss church and I'm speaking to people that have raised godly kids and I'm speaking to people that run their business on Christian principles I'm speaking to all of you because you have to understand that even a man after God's own heart can have heart trouble we're talking about David here you know what happens when a man gets his heart right God doesn't, in moments of repentance and in moments of perspective, when we get our hearts right with him, he doesn't take us back to where we once were. He takes us higher. David got something in a new proportion that he had needed for a long time. He had needed a new filling of the fear of God. He had to have it. You see, God not only took 70,000 of his soldiers because he numbered the army. But he also sent one of his warring angels with a flaming sword to totally destroy Jerusalem. And it was only as the angel stood there at the walls of Jerusalem about to destroy the city of Jerusalem that God said, it's enough. And then David said, Lord, I'm the one you want. I I performed the sin. I'm the one that was full of pride. Don't continue to take all these people. 
And God said, then prepare a sacrifice. And David bought a threshing floor, a piece of land from a man for, listen to this, 600 pieces of silver. <laughs> that had to be the most expensive land transaction in history. And then he made a sacrifice there. But the Bible says this, said, but David didn't go near the sacrifice. L listen to this, because he was afraid of that angel. I read that and I said, hallelujah. He got it. Ladies and gentlemen, God is not good old God. Jesus is not my pal. Let me tell you, we have been given friendship with our sovereign, but that is a great, great privilege. But when we come into the presence of our God, we need to understand that he is holy and he is great and he is powerful and that he is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And yes, we love him, but we love him with a holy fear because we know who he is. I loved my daddy with all of my heart, but I never popped off to him. Oh, yes, I did. I did pop off to him. And there was immediate, quick retribution. He had a left hand like Muhammad Ali. And let me tell you this. When we serve God, we have got to get back to fearing him. To knowing that everything we do has consequences and everything we say has consequences because what we do and what we say and where we go and who we hang with and our values are all an indication of heart trouble or either a healthy heart. That's why when David sinned so greatly, he said, Create in me a new. Create in me a new. He knew he had heart trouble. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Man, let me just say this to you. If you know you've got some heart trouble, and you say, Pastor, thank you for uncovering me. Thank you. Thank you. Because I hope I've done it lovingly. And I hope you understand that in no way will I ever stand here holding anyone at arm's length. That when I preach, I hope it's like just a loving papa who says, come on in here and get changed by the power of God. At least that's what I'm feeling in my heart. I love you. I don't want God, listen, I don't want God to have to do something to get your attention about your heart trouble. You can solve your heart trouble today. And if that's you, and you'll say, Pastor, thank you. Thank you for uncovering me. Thank you that the Word of God has been good to me today to show me some pride in my heart. Just get up and come to this altar right now because what we're going to do is just seek God. And God's going to do a wonderful thing in our hearts. We're going to just pray because that's what we do. That's what we do when we have heart trouble is we pray. We seek God. Just come right now to this altar. Say, I got heart trouble. I know it. I feel it. I got heart trouble. God's got to, got to get a hold of me. Hallelujah. 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 Bless the name of the Lord. Yeah. 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 Praise God. Praise God. Now, I want to give you, please hear me. I want you to hear point number three because it's important. Please hear me. God never breaks relationship during his dealings with us. If God's convicting you, good news. You belong to him. If he's dealing with you, good news. You belong to him. My daddy whipped me because I was his kid. Not everybody got the privilege of being Rodney Duran's kid. I'm going to tell you, those things I'll never forget. I would tell my dad at times, Dad, that's fine. Thank you. And then I had this son who has the toughest behind in history, Denny Rodney. 
I'd spank him. He never cried. He would just reach up, kiss me on the cheek and say, Daddy, I'm sorry I made you do that. Then I was the one that had to go to the altar. <laughs> God never breaks relationship during his dealings with us. Can somebody here say an amen so he can hear it? Amen. Yes. Thank you, Lord. Now, here's what you have to understand. Today, God honors our surrender and he takes us at our place of understanding. This was so beautiful. Here's what the Bible said about Jesus. It said a smoldering wick he will not extinguish. Did you ever have parents or grandparents that would do this thing like this and then just put the deal out? You know, I burned myself so bad trying to do that. Let me, let me just tell you this. Hey, hey. God, God says this, when there's just, listen, when all you are is a smoldering wick, when there's not much fire left, said he will never put you out. Is that wonderful? Hallelujah. So however you come in whatever stage you come today, mark it down. You're accepted. You're loved. Hallelujah. Right now, though, we repent. Lift your hands before God and say, God, search my heart. Just say it. Say, God, search my heart. I need a new heart. I need you to deal with some things in me that I didn't know had gotten out of hand. Come on, just tell it. But now I know they have. And so I ask you, deal with it. And I want you to say this to the Lord. Lord, I'm so thankful that you gave me a new heart. So I haven't thanked you enough for that. Just lift your hands and thank him that he gave you a new heart. Isn't that amazing that you have a heart like his? Lord, thank you that you gave me a brand new heart. And say, Lord, please help me. Repeat right after me. Please help me to not be casual or sloppy about the way I take care of my heart. Show me every day how I can be heart healthy. Show me, oh God, how I can have your power to give me authority over everything in my heart. Now just wait on the Lord for a minute. Wait on the Lord for a minute. Now what's got to happen right now is this. I want you to shift your thinking into great believing that the work is done. So I want you just to stand quietly before God, but I want you to shift your thinking right now. Focus your thinking into the work is done in me. Shift your thinking. Does that mean you're not going to battle with think? No, it doesn't. But it just means that you're going to have a bead on this thing and you're going to understand that you're not going to lapse into laziness and lethargy and no longer pay attention to it. You're going to be aware of it and what God's doing right now. Just, just shift your thinking into, God, I believe. Lord, I believe. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Praise God. Thank you, Lord. God, I thank you that this is the beginning of a revival in us. I thank you that this is the beginning of a revival in this house. We are going to be heart people. People that understand the, the great privilege of having a new heart. We're not going to go back to our old thinking, to our old actions and ways. God, we've been kind of slipping back lately because we just didn't have this awareness. Now, Lord, thank you that you've given it to us. You have given us this glorious awareness of our heart. In Jesus' name, God, we thank you. God, we thank you. God, we thank you. Oh, God, we love you. Hallelujah. Sing this with me. I love you, Lord, and I lift 
my voice to worship you, to worship you, oh my soul, rejoice, take joy, my King, joy, my King, in what you hear, let it be a sweet sweet dove in your ear. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Just give him glory and praise right now. He's so worthy. He's so worthy. Now I'm going to give you I'm going to give you the extraordinary ending of this whole story. Like I said, I'm still studying it, trying to make sense of it all. But the things I do know, I feel like I know. And here's the end of the story. You know that place for sacrifice that David bought? That place was the exact place that the temple of God was going to be built and it will be the very place where Jesus appears when he comes back to the planet how many of you understand that you go a lot higher <laughs> once you get your heart right amen because that's God's will and that's God's purpose. Hallelujah. Well, I believe that this blessing is going to mean more to you today. And then after I bless you, then you can come make the announcements because I want to fit this in right up against the message. Can I do that? This is, everybody say, a royal psalm. Amen. Praise God. Where, where is the, uh, the blessing? There it is. What's behind me? Okay. May the God of Jacob protect you from all harm. May the Lord answer you when you're in distress. May he send you help from the sanctuary and grant you support from Zion. May he remember all your sacrifices except all your best offerings. May he give you the desire of your heart. Make all your plans succeed. Yes, we will shout for joy over your victory. Lift up our banners in the name of our God. Everybody shouted with me. May the Lord answer all your prayers. Now say this with me. Some trust in chariots. Some in horses. But we will remember the name of the Lord our God. Give the Lord praise right now. 